Well, good evening to you all. If you turn to Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to read our first there this evening, although we won't stay there this evening. It's very good to see you, good to worship with you, good to study with you. This is the time in our worship where we break open the Word of God and we see what the Holy Spirit has revealed to us about how we ought to live and how to please God with our lives. And I pray that we'll be benefited by this time studying together. Before we get into our study, I would just like to add a brief word to what, uh, what Brother Don said at the beginning of our service. I would just like to say that I feel extremely blessed to be a member of a family that has an eldership, a leadership that thinks so thoroughly about what's good for this family. And I am extremely grateful to all of our elders here for the thought that they've put into keeping us safe while we worship. If you find an elder, please, please thank them for the thought they've put into that this evening. They do us, they do us great good, and they love us very much. With that being said, I'd like to speak to you this evening about making our resolutions stick. It's fitting, given that it is the end of this year and uh, the end of this decade, apparently, and as uh, somebody came up to me, the end of all decades, uh, somebody came up to me and said, don't be nervous tonight, last decade, Jonathan. They misspoke, but I just thought, that's, that's a pretty serious thing, last decade. But, uh, but it, is, it is important that we talk about this coming year. It's important that we talk about making our resolutions stick. You know, we read in the Bible that God, God wants Christians to grow. That's something that he is all about. That's something that you can read about all throughout your Bible. That God wants a fundamental part of Christianity is the idea of continual growth, striving onward, pressing forward. And in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul writes to the Ephesians and he tells them, he tells them that he has given us, he's given us prophets and teachers and pastors and evangelists to equip these saints up to the point in verse 13 until we all attain to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. And what that means, brothers and sisters, is that God wants us to keep growing, and He's given us tools, He's given us brethren, He's given us aids, so that we can continue growing up until the point that we're all Jesus Christ. That's when you can stop growing when you're as good as Jesus. And so all of us need to be thinking about, need to be thinking about our growth. And that's why I love this time, because we stand here on the precipice of a new year. And at this time, we're all thinking about growth, aren't we? At this time especially, mankind gets especially motivated. We start thinking about growth. We start thinking about how to better ourselves. We start thinking about self-improvement. There is a special freshness, a newness, a cleanness that comes with a brand new year. And nearly everyone in this country starts thinking about how they would like to be better in 2020 as opposed to what they were in 2019. And that motivation is a beautiful thing. Because we all ought to be thinking about how we can grow spiritually, how we can be better tomorrow than we are today. And I hope that everyone here, seeing as none of us have reached the measure of Jesus Christ, I hope that every single one of us here has put some thought into how we would like to be better, into how we expect to improve as we come into this new year of 2020. That being said, we all know what normally happens to our resolutions, don't we? Now, I love, I love the new year because I am an eternal optimist. I love, I love the motivation. I love to look forward. I have all these high, idealist, idyllic hopes about what this new year is going to be. But there are pessimists out there. You don't have to raise your hand. <clears throat> we already know who you are. Um, there are pessimists out there who say, yeah, but what happens to all those great, great uh, New Year's resolutions by the time we get to February? And you know what? That's exactly right. A lot of the time, those resolutions that we make, those ideas we have about how I'm going to spiritually grow, usually by the time February comes around, they have bitten the dust. We know the disappointment well, don't we? How many resolutions have you made 
at the beginning of a new year, only to see by the end of 365 days, you're basically right back where you started. And so it's important for us to discuss, what can I do to make sure that my resolution sticks? What can I do to make sure that in my spiritual life, I actually see the growth that I intend at the beginning of a new year? How do I see the growth that I desire in 2020? And I think that the Bible provides us a wonderful answer to that. I think the Bible provides a very, very important answer that if we want to grow spiritually in 2020, that we're going to have to make sure that we sow the right seeds. I think that is the key to making sure that our resolution sticks, to making sure that we see the growth that we want in this new year, to make sure we sow the right seeds. And so this evening, I have three points about sowing the right seeds, and then the lesson will be yours. I'm just kidding. I don't have three points for you this evening, but what I would like to do is I want to show you, I want to show you to start that there is a biblical principle that within the universe, God has established a law. And it is a law that holds true across the gambit of human experience. God has established a law that holds true in our relationships. It holds true in business. It holds true in our finances. And yes, more, most importantly, it holds true in our spiritual walk. And the law that God has established in this universe that's going to help us keep our resolutions is this. You reap what you sow. You reap what you sow. Go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. At the very beginning, the very beginning of your Bible, God describes, or Moses writes, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he writes about the creation of the world. And in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 11, Moses describes in his writing, when God created the very first growing thing. And I want you to see what he says there. Genesis chapter 1 in verse 11, where the Bible says, Then God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees on the earth bearing fruit after their kind with seed in them. And it was so. And the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was very good. And so you see it on the very third day of creation, God created vegetation, the very first growing thing. And he said that those growing things, that that vegetation would, it would grow bearing seeds within it. And that when those seeds were planted in the ground, it would produce fruit according to its kind. So when you took a seed from one of those plants that God created, and you buried it in the ground, and you watered it, and you let it get sunlight, and you watched it grow, it would produce something of the same kind that it came from. They would bear fruit according to the same kind. So when you plant a tomato seed in the ground, what do you get? You can tell me. You get a tomato. We all agree on that. When you plant a tomato seed, you get a tomato. You never get anything but a tomato unless you're like me and you can't grow anything. Then you just get death, okay? When you plant a tomato seed, you either get nothing or you get a tomato. What you reap depends on what you sow. And that's how it works with all growing things. On the fifth day, God creates the birds and the sea creatures, and they produce after their own kind. And on the sixth day, God creates animals and men, and they both produce after their own kind. Every seed produces according to its own kind. And so a tomato seed produces a tomato, and a squirrel's seed produces a squirrel, and a man's seed produces a man. From the beginning of creation, God established this law that you reap according to what you have sown. And the Bible is clear that this law, you reap what you sow, is not confined to the animal kingdom, and it's not confined to the agricultural realm. It is also true in a spiritual sense that you reap what you've sown. You see, brothers and sisters, what the Bible teaches us is that my actions, my daily habits are like little seeds. And depending on what my habits are, they're going to produce a certain kind of fruit. My daily habits, 
My actions are going to produce a certain kind of consequence in my life. I will reap according to what I have sown. And so if we turn to Proverbs, we see, we see this all over the place. If you turn to the book of Proverbs, in Proverbs 22, Proverbs 22 and verse 8, we see Solomon, Solomon uh, trades on this language here. Solomon uh, in Proverbs 22 and verse 8 says, He who sows iniquity will reap vanity, and the rod of his fury will perish. And so in this language, in the language of this book, Solomon says that when you engage in iniquity, which is another word for wrongdoing, he says when you engage in that, it produces something in your life. And Solomon says when you plant the seeds of iniquity, you get trouble. That's just the way it works. When you plant the seeds of wrongdoing, you get trouble in your life. We see this in another case in Hosea chapter 10. Go ahead and turn there, Hosea 10 and verse 13 Hosea 10 and verse 13, where the prophet, when speaking to Israel, is going to say this. He says, you have plowed wickedness. You have reaped injustice. You have eaten the fruit of lies because you have trusted in your way in your numerous warriors. And so in Hosea 10 and verse 13, the prophet uses that same kind of language. You reap what you sow. What you plant is what you produce in your life. He says, when you plant wickedness, when you choose not to serve God, when you choose to be evil, it has a result. It causes you to commit injustice against others. And if you look at the preceding verse in Hosea 10 and verse 12, you get a positive spin on the same idea. Where Hosea says this, sow with a view to righteousness and reap in accordance with with kindness. Break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord until He comes to rain righteousness on you. And so we get a different spin on it in Hosea 10 and verse 20. Yes, if you plant wickedness, you're going to get injustice toward others. But if you plant righteousness, you're going to get kindness and love for others. You reap what you sow. And we could play that game for days. We won't read all of these passages, but we know, we know James chapter 1 and verse 20 says, the, the, the anger of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. And so we see that if we, if we plant that seed of anger and we let that anger grow in us, that it leads us to do things that are unrighteous. And if we look in Philippians, Philippians 4 in chapter, six, uh, chapter 4 in verse 6, the Bible says this, Philippians 4 and verse 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so, if we plant the seed of prayer, it has a certain, it has a certain fruit in our life. And that is the fruit of peace, the peace of God, which surpasses understanding. And then there's the famous, there's the famous commentary of Jesus in Matthew 7, where He talks about false prophets coming in to disrupt the citizens of his kingdom. And he tells them, you need to understand this about false prophets, that false prophets always produce bad fruits. And so he says, look, by their fruits you shall know them. If you want to know this person is a false prophet, if you want to know if they really come from God or if they're just somebody who doesn't come from God, you look at their fruit. Because I guarantee you, if they are a false prophet, they cannot produce good fruit. And if they are a good prophet, they cannot produce bad fruit. You reap what you sow. We see it all over the text. And this is well summed up by Paul's words in, in Galatians chapter 6. Go ahead and turn there with me. Galatians chapter 6, what we read in our Bible reading, our Scripture reading before at the very beginning of this service. Galatians 6 and verse 7 where Paul writes this to the church in Galatia. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the f flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. Let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. You reap what you sow. What you plant is what you produce in your life. And so just like you would never plant a tomato seed and expect a watermelon, in much the same way we have to appreciate. We have to appreciate that when we, when we look at something like we have on the slide behind me, we can't expect to plant the seeds on the left and end up with anything other than the produce on the right. 
We can't, we can't believe that we're going to plant one kind of seed and we're going to reap a different kind of fruit. We reap according to what we have sown. That's just the way it works in this world. And while we're here in Galatians chapter 6, I think it's important that we point out, point out the very first phrase that Paul uses in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 7, where he says, do not be what? Do not be deceived. Now, why would he stop and say that? Why do sometimes, why do sometimes the, the, the writers of your Bible stop and say, do not be deceived? Because they're about to talk about something that men are often deceived about. In this law, you reap what you sow. This is something we often deceive ourselves about, isn't it? Many, many, many times we tell ourselves that we will reap something different than what we've sown. It is something about which we are easily, easily deceived. You know, there's a Greek philosopher, his name was Archilochus. And he had this great quote. I think it's so important for us to understand, understand ourselves and understand uh, this idea of reaping and sowing. He said, he said, we do not rise to the level of our expectations. We fall to the level of our training. And too often when it comes to our resolutions, when it comes to the spiritual growth that we want to see in our lives, that's exactly how we are deceived. Is we tell ourselves we are going to rise to the level of our expectations. We say, I want to grow. I want to be different. I want to be better in this new year. I want to be a better husband. I want to be a better father. I want to read my Bible more. I want a deeper faith. And we tell ourselves that we're going to be different by the time 365 days is over because we want to be different. We expect, we expect that we are going to rise to the level of our expectations. But that's not how it works. We focus on what we want to be rather than focusing on what seeds we have to plant in order to get there. There's a scene, there's a scene in a movie called Secondhand Lines. Anybody seen that movie, Secondhand Lines? It came out a while back. I was a teenager then. Does that make any of you feel old? But there's a scene in that movie that perfectly illustrates this point. There's, there's these, these two older men and a younger boy who are living together on a, on, on a big piece of land. And they decide one day that they're going to go out and they're going to they're gonna plant a garden in the back of the house. And so they go out, they go to the store, and they get a bunch of different packets of seeds. And then they go back to the house and they plow up the little space for the garden. And then they go out and they start planting those seeds. And they got all kinds of different seeds, right? They got seeds of, of tomatoes and corn and broccoli and cauliflower and, and bok Choy. They got all kinds of different vegetables that they're planting in this garden, expecting to have this great variety of vegetables to enjoy when it finally grows. But as they watch their garden grow, they start to realize something about all the plants that are in it. It all looks like corn. And eventually, by the time it's matured in the actual produce, as at the end of the plant, they realize that it was just corn. And somehow there had been some kind of mix-up with the seeds that were in the pack. All that time they expected to get this wide variety of vegetables that they could enjoy, but they're stuck with just corn because, because those are the seeds they planted. It didn't matter what they expected. It didn't matter what they wanted. It didn't matter what they envisioned in their future. The only thing that mattered is what they actually put in the ground to grow. And that's how it works with us. It doesn't matter what we expect. It doesn't matter what we desire. Just like the men in that movie. Many people expect to produce a certain fruit, but while their expectations change, their habits do not. And so therefore, therefore, many people get to the end of the year and they realize they're exactly where they started because even though their expectations changed, their habits did not and so, brothers and sisters, we must be certain that in terms of our spiritual growth, in terms of those resolutions that you're making in this coming year, we must make sure that we're planting the right seeds. Because at the end of the day, we do not rise to the level of our spiritual aspirations. We fall to the level of our spiritual 
habits. It doesn't matter what you expect, what you desire, what you envision. What matters, what matters is what you actually plant. As Paul says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. And so with that principle in mind, I want to ask you, what seeds will you sow in 2020. I want you to think about it. Think about those aspirations that you have. Think about those expectations. Think about the way that you want to be different in 2020. Think about what you want to fix, how you want to get better, what you want to improve in your life. But don't stop there. Ask yourself the second question. What seeds do I need to plant? What habits do I need to build in order to produce that kind of fruit in my life? Ask yourself the question, am I sowing the right seeds? And so it may be that there are some people here who want to grow a deeper faith in the new year. Maybe you want to be able to trust God more. You want to be able to lean on Him more. You want to have a faith that can stand any storm so that when something bad happens in your life, you don't run away from God. You stick with Him. You want a deeply rooted faith. That's a wonderful thing to have. That's a wonderful thing to aspire to. But the question is, are you planting the right seeds to get you there. Romans 10 and verse 17 says, for faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. If you want that deeper faith, there's a habit you're going to have to build. You're going to have to put yourself in position to hear the word of Christ a lot. You're going to have to get into that book and understand what it says and read those stories about the great people of faith. And if you don't do that, if you don't plant that seed, you can't expect the produce. Or maybe you're looking at your life and you say, look, I want less stress. I want less worry. I want to be able to be content and and not be full of worry, not be choked out by the worries of life. And that's a wonderful thing to want because, because the worries of life, they get us into spiritual trouble all the time. But the question is, are you planting the right seeds that are going to produce that fruit? Philippians 4 and verse 6, as we read earlier, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Paul says, look, if you want that peace that passes understanding, you need to have a good habit of prayer. Prayer, supplication with thanksgiving. Those are the kind of seeds that produce that fruit in our lives, that peace in our lives. Or maybe you're looking at your life and you say, look, I need to control my tongue better this year. I need less cussing, less gossip. I need to to insult people less and hurt people less with my words. And that's a noble aim. But you got to do more than just want it or expect to do better with that. You have to plant the right seeds. And so Jesus would say in Matthew 12, in verse 34 and 35, you brood of vipers, To the Pharisees, not to you. How can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good, and the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. So you may want to do better with your words this year, but look, if you're filling up your heart with all kinds of filthy entertainment, all kinds of songs that are full of cussing and vitriol, if you're watching things on TV where people are ugly and nasty to each other all the time, How can you expect? How can you expect to produce anything other than that with your language and your words? You reap what you sow. Or how about this, brothers and sisters? How about a happier marriage? How about a healthier, happier, God pleasing marriage. Don't you want your marriage to be better in 2020 than it has been in 2019? Don't you want to grow? Don't you want a healthier relationship with your spouse? That's true. I think that's something we all want. But the question is, are you planting the right seeds that are going to produce that good, godly marriage? And the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 5 what kind of seeds we have to plant to get there. Wives, Wives, Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 5 in verse 22 what seeds we have to plant to get that good godly marriage. He says, wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. And so as a wife, if I want to build up my marriage and make it healthy and strong and godly, I have to plant the seeds of submission and respect. And Paul says this in 5 verse 25, men, if you want a happier, healthier marriage, you have to do this. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. 
A healthy marriage means that a husband needs to plant the seeds of true leadership in sacrificial love. Can I say it? Do not be deceived. Because this is something about which we're often deceived, isn't it? These are the seeds that produce a good marriage. And let me be very clear. Men, the seeds of machismo do not produce a good marriage. The puff out your chest my way or the highway approach, I want it so that's what we're going to do, that seed does not produce a good marriage. And ladies, feminism does not produce a good marriage. Those seeds produce a very different kind of fruit. These are the seeds that produce a good marriage in our lives. You reap what you sow. That's the biblical principle. Or maybe you have some broken relationships in your life, some broken relationships that you need mended. But we have to plant the right seeds if we're going to mend those relationships. As, as Paul says, he gives us those seeds in Ephesians 4, verses 2 through 3, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Fixing broken relationships means I need to plant the seeds of humility and gentleness, patience and tolerance, and all of that, of course, being united with what is true and what is right. And of course, we can't skip this passage. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. If you need any more of any of that, the answer is Walking by the Spirit and getting yourself into the Word of God and being willing to obey what God has given you in His words. The Bible teaches us that we reap what we sow. And so as we think about making our resolutions stick, as we think about actually seeing the growth that we want to see, that we expect to see in 2020, let us not just think about what we expect or what we desire or what we wish Let us also consider what seeds we have to plant, what daily habits I need to engage in in order to actually see the growth that we desire. And there's one more thing that I would like to add to this discussion. And that is that that we have to appreciate that there is a reason the Holy Spirit uses the imagery that He does, right? We're using an agricultural metaphor, aren't we? And there's a reason we're talking about sowing and reaping and planting and plowing and watering and all of these things and producing fruit. Because the truth is, spiritual growth, much like agricultural growth, doesn't happen overnight. It's not something that is instantaneous, is it? You know, the farmer knows that produce doesn't appear instantaneously or even daily or even weekly. The farmer knows that to reap a good harvest... He must keep working, even when he can't physically see the fruit of his labor. In the spring, he gets out into his field, and he works day by day, all day long, planting and plowing and sowing seeds. And and as he does that, as he gets up and and, and he plows his field and he plants his seed, he leaves his field that afternoon, and he goes in and he sleeps that night. And guess what he finds when he wakes up the next morning? He finds a field that looks exactly like he left it the day before. That's the life of a farmer. That's the life of producing fruit. What would you think of that farmer? What would you think of that farmer if that farmer went to sleep that night after he just plowed his field and just planted his seeds and he went out into his field the next day and he saw that nothing had changed visually? And he said, you know what? This farming thing doesn't work. I quit. I'm giving up. I'm going to sell the farm. I'm going to do something else because obviously farming doesn't work. What would you say about that farmer? You'd say he's a fool. You'd say he hasn't talked to Jim Harbaugh. You'd say he obviously doesn't understand what he's doing. Brothers and sisters, when it comes to us producing the spiritual growth that we need to produce, 
Let us make sure that we understand what we are doing. This is not something that happens instantaneously. It's not something that happens overnight. It's not something that changes in a day or in a week or in a month even. Spiritual growth is something that happens slowly, step by step. And so as Paul will write to the church in Galatia in in Galatians chapter 6, we need to remember what he says here in verse 9. Galatians 6 and verse 9, let us not lose heart in doing good, for in due time we will reap. For in due time we will reap if we do not grow weary. So keep planting the right seeds. And Paul says, eventually you will reap according to what you have sown. We will reap fruit according to to its kind. And so as we come and we think about our resolutions, we think about making them stick, make sure you're planting the right seeds and make sure that even though you don't see that instantaneous growth, make sure you keep planting those seeds because God has promised you will reap according to what you have sown. As we close out this evening, I I just want to point out one more passage, one more passage that we ought to recognize when it comes to bearing fruit. And that's what Jesus says. It's what Jesus says in John chapter 15, John chapter 15 in verse 4, where Jesus says this. He says, Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And that passage teaches us two very important things about spiritual growth, about producing fruit. Number one, it teaches us that for those of us who are in Christ, that the fruit that we bear is not something that we can boast over. It's not something that I can look, look at myself and say, look how great I am. Look at all the ways that I grew. But when I produce fruit and when I become better and when I improve myself, I need to turn around and I need to look at Jesus and say, look what Jesus did in me. I am just a branch. He is the vine. He generates all the fruit. And the second thing we need to appreciate is that that if we are not connected to the vine, we can do nothing. We can do nothing. Which means that bearing fruit and doing good things and serving God in my life, it starts with a simple step. It starts with getting connected to the true vine. And the Bible tells us there's a very simple way to do that, that anyone can do right here, right now. The Bible says that if I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and I'm willing to confess that belief before men, and repent of my sins, which caused Him to die on the cross in the first place, then I can be baptized in water, have my sins washed away, and be clothed with Christ. You'll be connected to the vine and ready to bear fruit for him in your life. If we can help you do that or anything else, we invite you to come to the front while we stand, while we sing.